This bee bomb is literally crawling with bees. Wow. I just thought, a pink onion, why not try it? Our hostas do well in Minnesota. They like our temperatures. We have things blooming from early spring to late fall. It's fun to imagine what this place will be like in a few years. We've just gotten started. Hello, and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm your host, Sharon Young. Thanks for joining us for our first show of 2024. Tonight, we have a special hour-long episode. It's still winter, but that doesn't mean we can't help you prepare for the growing season with helpful tips and tricks. As usual, we have our garden experts with us, and they are horticulturist and educator, Bob Olin, and garden professional, Deb Burns Erickson. We want to hear from gardeners across our region who have questions for our experts. We have phone volunteers from the Duluth Garden Flower Society here to receive your questions this evening. Call locally, 218-788-2844, or email us at ask at pbsnorth.org. Tonight's program is also part of our spring fundraiser. A membership with PBS North gives our viewers an opportunity to support great gardening, PBS North, and a host of other programs we can broadcast. Donations can be sent in the same contact information on your screen. Let's begin tonight's show with a garden tour. In 2023, we visited the gardens of Lee Iverson. She's an avid gardener from Hibbing who cultivates diverse front and backyard spaces. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Lee Iverson. We're in Hibbing, Minnesota, and I'm here to share my perennial gardens with you, and I welcome you. Well, my husband and I have lived here for right around 30 years, and when we moved in, there was really no gardens here at all, and I had no gardening experience. As a young new homeowner, I wanted some flowers. I planted a little garden outside my back door with just annuals. Gardening gets in your soul, into your pores. Gardening is addictive, and soon I wanted another garden, and another garden, and another garden. I joined the Chisholm Hibbing Garden Club, which helped me um, immensely. These front gardens were a really big step for me. Um, stepping out of your box, realizing that anybody who drives by or walks by is gonna see what's growing and what's not growing. This is Miscanthus. It's been here for years and years. It will get taller. Grass adds height and some contrast to what else is going on. And it's maintenance free. I don't have to deadhead it at all. This is cat mint, the purple. Not that it attracts cats, but it does smell very minty and it spreads. It was started out as a little pot. Plants have a zillion names. They have a Latin name, a scientific name, a common name, a local name. They have the name your grandmother calls them. Um, these are a violet, but they are also called Johnny Jump Ups. They're related to the pansy. Uh, they self-seed and many people say to me, why don't you pull those? Those are a weed. Well, no, to me, they're gorgeous. Look at the blooms on them, they're very sweet. This um, Creeping Jenny actually has some blooms. They're not spectacular, but they have little yellow blooms. And of course, I grow that for, again, for the texture and the color of the leaf rather than the bloom. You can see this little guy here. This is a rose campion, and this self-seeds itself. Sometimes they come out pink. This is a white and a light pink. Again, welcome to my garden. I'm not sure where you came from. This is Spirea. It's a bush. There's actually two types in here. You can barely tell. The blooms are just slightly different. Yeah, the bushes add a nice backdrop to your garden. It's been a real warm, heartening thing to have gardens in front because my neighbors appreciate it. People stop, people drive by, people walk by with their dogs. People tell me, oh, I come by almost every day to see what's growing in your garden, and they all appreciate it so much. You just took a tour of Lee Iverson's front yard garden, but there's more. Later in tonight's show, we'll take a look at the blooms and blossoms of her backyard space. Keep calling in your questions, and we'll get to them shortly. But first, Bob is here to summarize last year's climate and predict the year to come. This should be a lot of fun, because uh, we obviously have had some weather extremes, and it's gonna be the topic of a lot of discussion. I wanna take you back just a little bit. Remember. It was last winter, they had record snowfalls, and right up through the, uh, the end of March. And then suddenly in May, it got extremely dry for us. And we had the driest May and June on record. And then 
through our meteorological summer, which is the time when most plants are doing their growing, we remained very, very dry. Southern part of our viewing area down in the Carlton County, they really had extreme drought. In the north, they had a little bit more moisture, but it was dry everywhere. So we finished up that season very, very dry. And then suddenly in September, it started to rain. So we were seven inches below normal at the end of August, and we were three inches above average for the entire year. So what do you say with nice. averages? It was a very wet year, except not when we really wanted to grow things. So what does that say about what's coming up here? And that's the big question on people's minds. Obviously, this winter has been, again, very remarkable, very limited snowfall at this particular point, and it's been warmer than average, both November and December, extremely warm, above average. And uh, we cannot really remember a brown Christmas, or at least I can't before. And personal experience, I'm out there on Christmas Eve, it's raining, I'm in a raincoat, I'm in mud boots, and I'm, I'm down trying to cover my garlic, and I'm halfway up my calves in mud, <laughs> and a rain shower. So that is really remarkable, and the same kind of pattern continued in both um, January and February, warmer than normal, and very limited snowfall. Now the remarkable thing is that we only had about 16 inches uh, and this is almost the lowest snowfall ever at this point. Our lowest record of snowfall was 36 and a half inches back in the 1980-81 year. We're at 16 now, so we don't really know what's going to happen in March, but we, got, we might be setting another one of these extreme records, and I'm not so sure if that's good or bad, but now the easy part is predicting what's coming this coming growing season. And of course, we don't really know that because it tends to fool us all the time. And obviously we would say get ready to grow peppers and tomatoes and other things because these are our warm season crops. And a lot of sweet corn, maybe it's your sweet corn, so we'll see what, uh, what happens there. But my advice at this point is uh, be prepared for just about anything because we really don't know. It's been surprising us and obviously even some of the long term weather forecasts have been uh, wrong. Uh, the general trends have been right, but we don't know from day to day and month to month. Now one of our real concerns is did we break buds in this warm spell that we came mm -hmm. through? And I went around, I'm gonna ask Deb for her yep. opinions. Nope. Not, yet. Not yet. Not yet. This is a remarkable thing it's and wonderful. the wonderful thing because uh, if you'd broken buds, particularly flower buds on your apples, Fruit. pear trees, mm -hmm. uh, that could have been devastating with the That's cold really weather we sure. had the last couple of nights. Mm -hmm. Maple trees giving a lot of sap. People pulled uh, and made syrup February 15th rather than March or April 15th. Mm -hmm. Uh, this year, and yet those uh, maple buds are still very tight, which is an indication of the end of this, the sap run. Yeah. So, and what's I your opinion? My, my opinion is day length. I think that Mother Nature and the plants, they know what they're doing, and they're going to, according to the day length, be much more triggered okay. than the temperature. And the, But once we get into those longer days, once we're rolling into March and farther into March, then it's going to be a bigger issue. Could be the science and the physiology behind some of this winter hardiness is really intriguing stuff mm -hmm. that we don't completely understand. Are you saying that plants know more than the humans do? Well, in that respect, right? Or, yeah. or yeah. maybe or, many respects. Well, or even like the <laughs> peach trees, right? They need snow cover on their roots. Yes, they and, do. You know, because once those roots start to wake up. But again, I'm going to go with um, on the day length. And the reason we, we really don't have native... Uh, apricots, peaches, we have a few exotics, but they tend to pop buds early and then we tend to freeze them down. Yeah. Where apples, we pop them a little bit later. So hopefully uh, we don't know, and anyone that does know, uh, I would kind of challenge them. We'll see if their record's right. But I would say be prepared for warm and dry, but also for cool and wet, at least the wet portion, maybe not the cool, because we are definitely in a warming trend here. Mm -hmm. It's nice, hmm? nice propane bills for everyone. And the, the great thing is, when we look back at last year's uh, conditions, we didn't have intense heat. We were actually cooler in the month of July. We had average daytime temperatures of 74 mm -hmm. in June, 75 in, in uh, July, and then about 73 in August. Just absolutely perfect, perfect for growing. We've got lots of light, and it could be that we are setting ourselves up for a tremendous year and potentially a wonderful area to grow many, many things in. We have the light. It was always the limitation of temperature and season length. We're extending our growing season a little bit. And uh, with temperatures that aren't extreme, but warm, uh, we might be in very good shape for gardening. Mm -hmm. Better than some other areas. Yeah, better than hot and dry in the mm -hmm. southwest mm -hmm. where they experience it that way. So again, we got the light, and if we get to cooperative uh, temperatures, which we're getting, uh, this could be a very phenomenal place to be a gardener.
of all types, more even mm -hmm. warm season crops. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Awesome. Well, thanks, Bob. Let's get to your questions. Kristen from Carleton is asking um, about her small, big garden in Twin Lakes Township in Carleton County that's about 40 feet by 45 feet with permanent plantings of raspberries at the north edge and strawberries at the south edge. Given our ongoing abnormally dry and likely worsening drought situation, what would you recommend as a good drought tolerant cover crop and maybe help keep down on weeds like purslane? I'm likely to plant only minimal vegetable this season and thought a green manure could be beneficial on various fronts. What are your thoughts? Hmm. Well, a couple of things, if I can comment quickly. First, we don't know, so just don't assume right. that don't it's going to be it up, hot no. and dry. And then I'm assuming that she wants, she mentioned a cover crop and green manure. Now that means incorporating this vegetative material mm -hmm. into the bed and also something on weed control. Now your thoughts on weed control would be? But I, would, mm. I would be doing uh, black poly mulch. I just mm -hmm. like black poly mulch. You, I mean, it keeps things uh, more consistently moist. If she's worried about, maybe she doesn't do any extra watering or doesn't have a water source, but it's amazing cutting out the weed pressure and cutting out the drying of the soil with that poly, like uh, Bio 360, that it, it can really, you, you will grow great crops. We did tomatoes and peppers last all summer. We never watered any of them. We had the best crop we've ever had. So I wouldn't give up. No, and I think she can drop transplants certainly into a black mm -hmm. plastic yep. mulch, but you really can't seed underneath there. They need sunlight. So whatever she's going to seed as a good manure crop or as a, uh, a cover crop, it has the advantages of ultimately incorporating that organic when it dies down into the soil. And that's a great reservoir for moisture. So, um, you know, a rye crop or a, uh, a fall um, winter, winter rye is really exceptional as well. And then you're going to knock these back one way or another. You're going to cut them down or eliminate them, and you are going to incorporate the organic, and that mm -hmm. will help. That's one of the techniques that we're going to talk about for actually helping in dry periods when you don't have good irrigation set up. Get some more organic, whether it's your compost or whether it's a, a green cover crop that you work into the garden. But I was kind of intrigued. She's got a big, small garden. Is that kind of like the jumbo shrimp? Yeah. That type <laughs> of thing? yeah. That's great. That's perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Deb. Uh, we have a caller that asks about her garlic that's developed fungus during the curing stage. What should they do with the soil? Well, fungus during the curing stage, she, she just needs better ventilation. Uh, so that is, that is probably not specific oh, to the soil. Uh, garlic, and we do have a session coming up on growing garlic, but uh, garlic really is vulnerable to some viral mm -hmm. diseases. So you always want to rotate it, but I really think she's talking about curing, she's talking about storage. Uh, hang it in a dark, dry place, and uh, a little fan doesn't yeah, hurt that you perfect. run just to get it drier, and that eliminates a lot of the, uh, the problems with fungi and other things that might form on the outside skin of the garlic. And it'll cure it quicker, too. And it'll cure it quicker, yeah. yeah. So they come in, you want to dig early, don't want to dig too late. She may have done that this year. You'd never want to have been in September this year when you pulled your garlic because of the moisture we had, and maybe she harvested late. Let's get it out by August 15th, get it dried down, hung, and then uh, plant it again about October 15th. But this year, man, you could have planted on Christmas Eve and gotten away with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you could still dig in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alex emailed and asked, how do you prepare apple, plum, and crab apple trees for the year? Prepare them. Prepare, right? Uh, well, pruning? Are we talking pruning? Well, I'm not sure. I think you can dormant prune. That's the amazing thing. You can dormant prune even right now. Can you still? You could because we haven't broken bud. The yeah. key there is when you break bud, you want to stop because they're no longer getting, right? dormant. So she could clean them up a little bit, prune them. I don't think there's much necessary in terms mm -mm. of prep. Mm -mm. They really, you know, don't need a lot of fertility. Nope. If you're going to use a little fertility, that'll come right at bud break and you can use an organic on the upper surface, organic fertility, a, a good uh, rich compost or a well rotted manure, or you could use some synthetic fertilizer, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, much, right? Woodies Good like this cooking. don't need a lot of fertility. Great. Uh, we have a caller that is asking, um, I hear there are new peony variations. What are the best peonies of this new variation for Duluth proper? Mm. Hmm, interesting. I have not seen a whole lot available as far as new varieties. 
Um, I mean, I, I suppose there's all kinds of growers everywhere now, and they're creating new um, varieties. And they should all be pretty hardy because, yep. honestly, every peony is a zone three that I've ever seen. But I'm interested as far as availability and finding new varieties. I haven't seen a whole lot available other than small private growers. Yeah, I would agree. And just peonies in general have become very popular. Mm -hmm, they are mm -hmm. beautiful, but they mm -hmm. bloom over a short period of time. But hard to get some of that material. The Duluth mm -hmm. peony, which yeah. has a wonderful very reputation, beautiful, beautiful white mm -hmm. flower. We've been trying to get it for a couple of years. Yeah. So uh, if you can find it, uh, let's not worry about hardiness. Let's just uh, make sure we get it in and don't plant it too deep, right? And, right, and I know that mm -hmm. the, um, is it the Minneapolis has um, a peony society uh, sale every year, and that would be a great place to go to have um, lots of great information, but get there early. I know they sell out relatively quickly, yeah. especially with uh, new varieties. And they will not be inexpensive, but you consider they're a perennial that'll last for a lifetime if, if managed mm -hmm. properly. So just uh, take that price and divide it by 25 or 30 years and they look pretty cheap. And you could start, if you don't have any other peonies, start with some of the Sarah Bernhard, some of the less expensive Kansas sure. um, varieties to see if your soil, I mean, your soil should be okay, sure. but you might want to put a few in before you really get into the expensive varieties. Right. All right, keep sending in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can in tonight's hour long show. In a moment, our membership team is going to ask for your support of PBS North. And later, Deb will share with us her preparations for 2024. But first, let's finish our tour of Lee Iverson's Backyard Gardens. First, I want to tell you about this tree that we took down just last year. Lovely, huge pine tree that was just too big and beginning to die. And so we had to have it cut down. But I purposely asked them to leave the stump so that I could use the stump so the squirrels could still use the stump. I make my own planters. We put this up here and um, from the dining room inside, I can look out and see this lovely pot of petunias. This is one of my most favorite gardens. This is my hosta shade garden. Instead of all using one type of hosta, I've branched out and done every kind of hosta I could find. This is the Jurassic Park hosta, one of my favorites. It's called a blue color. And you can see kind of this leaf in particular is sort of blue, at least compared to this one, which looks a little greener. And look how big it is and how textured it is. It's tough. It um, almost has a waxy feel. Uh, it takes care of itself, and it really does seem prehistoric. That's just one of my favorite. And the fern behind for some height, because it's always good to have height. These ferns I brought in from the woods. My husband brought in from the woods and I wasn't sure how they would do, but they, they like it here and it helps to hide the air conditioner. And they're pretty, again, a fine leafed texture. There were a couple of trees back here. There was a big old birch that had to come down. My husband and I made garden after garden. I realized, oh, we need a nice place to sit and look at this garden and some shade would be nice because there wasn't any shade back here and it can get hot. Here's the funny story. I have a friend whose son built her pergola, just like this. And I ran home one day and I said, you have to come see my friend's pergola, hint, hint. And we went and looked at somebody else's pergola. And my husband came home and within the next couple of weeks, he built the deck and the pergola. And on top of the pergola is a Virginia, Virginia creeper, which is a native plant. You'll find it in the woods. Obviously, it spreads like crazy because this is all one plant. It literally takes over. It gives nice shade on the deck. It gives us space to eat, to hang out, to barbecue, to read, to visit, and just enjoy the gardens. Again, we've got the grass. This may be a little taller than what was in front, and there's grass behind me. My husband also built the flower box along the garage to, to display some petunias in. Isn't this a fantastic color? This is called a spikenard. You'll find some species of it native here in the woods. I know I have, but the color is fabulous, like a chartreuse, um, this greeny yellow, and it changes with the, the amount of sun it gets. It actually likes shade, but it gets more sun here, so it, it gets a brighter green. Here we have one cone flower. I'm excited that there's one cone flower out, and isn't that great? It's tangled up with the flowers, but that's that's lovely, lovely color and a good specimen. These two specimens are called porcupine grass. Whether it's because of the banded colors 
or the way they feel because they're very stiff and, and spiky. I originally started with, I think, two of these, and now I've spread them around and given them to my neighbors. These are quite old, I would say almost 20 years old. And the thing about this porcupine grass is that it's zone four. I didn't realize when I bought it that it's zone four and we're zone three. Because I'm here in the fence, close to a brick house that sucks in the heat, they've, been, they've managed to survive. And every year I hold my breath, is the porcupine grass going to come back? <laughs> and it takes it a while, it's very slow, but it does come back. But I've, I feel lucky that I've been able to keep this going, and it's so interesting, such an interesting grass. Gardening is physical. So and I, it's outside a lot, which I love, but sometimes it's very hot. The bugs have been quite nasty this year, so it, with the heat and the bugs, it's, it's sometimes been a challenge, but I love to be outside. Welcome back to Great Gardening. We have more coming up, including Deb discussing her preparation methods at Burns Greenhouse. Plus, we'll share upcoming events of interest to gardeners in our region. But first, let's get back to your questions. How long can you prune oak, apple, pine trees into the spring? She's got a nice mix there. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's a good question, actually, because oh. what stands out to me really is oaks. You have to be extremely careful. The others are going to be forgiving. But there's a best time to do it. And we want to prune. Let's start with the apples and, and other fruit-bearing deciduous trees. Prune them right up until the buds swell and break. That's a dormant prune. Uh, the pines, we're going to wait longer. So that means we're going to prune the, the apples into maybe early May or something like that, depending on the year. Uh, the pines, we're going to prune on the new growth, pines and spruce, and that'll be probably in June. So they come on the new growth, mm -hmm. and that's when we're going to be shaping and pruning. Now, the oak, and that's the reason why I'm glad she asked that question. We're always concerned about oak wilt, which is a devastating disease, and we're getting more oak as things warm up. Great tree, but you cannot prune those anytime there's a window, and it's, uh, it has been typically from April through July when that tree is very vulnerable to the uh, bacterial disease. It actually will kill it. So I'm saying maybe to be, we're warming up, let's not prune oak at all between maybe March 15th and July 15th, that window, stay away, and they can be pruned any time out of that window. So prune right now, you got a couple of weeks to <laughs> when you can prune those, but avoid that, that springtime period when they're very vulnerable. Great. Uh, we have an email that's asking hydrangeas, what to do with them in the spring after the winter months? Well, I have an opinion on that. I, there are so many new varieties mm -hmm. of hydrangeas, and unless you are really, you really know what your variety is, when it blooms, if it's old wood, if it's new wood, um, I always go back to, I like to shape mine after they're done blooming, because you're always safe then. But I feel like a lot of people start to prune them hard in the fall, and then if you're doing that, you know, and the, um, Oh, easy. What's the one that never did well? Endless summer. Endless summer, you know. Endless bummer. Endless bummer <laughs> right? You know, people will get to hammering on those in the fall, and they're not, it, no wonder they don't ever bloom for them. But I think you really need to look at your varieties and know what your varieties are. And if you don't have that, that's really good advice, because they are different, new wood, old wood. Take a look at the plant itself. And if All it's dried out and not green, you can prune down or prune down to the green point. But if there's any tissue that's above ground that is green that's going to grow, you definitely don't want to prune that off. Okay. If it's dry like mm -hmm. some of the old originals, uh, the snowballs and so forth, they're all dried. They can go right down to the ground and they actually prefer a spring prune like that and then they will rejuvenate from the roots. A caller's wondering, a caller is wondering if we have a cherry tree recommendation for the woodland area of Duluth. Sure. So, Bali, are we talking Bali? I would, s I would say Bali, mm -hmm. or Meteor, or North Star. So you really mm -hmm. have about mm -hmm. three of them, Masabi, too. So you may oh have yeah. four of them, Meteor, uh, Masabi, Bali, Bali, which is probably the most readily available right it now. It is, it is, It's yeah. quite readily available, mm -hmm. and then North Star. So we have some good cherries. They're not the Bing cherries. We've got to forewarn people. That may come if things continue right? to warm up. <laughs> But uh, I would say those are going to make uh, just great cherries for juice and for other jams and jellies and so forth. They're wonderful, really. Good. Uh, Brenda emailed and is having some vining weeds that are all over a sunny woodland property. 
They twist around each other on plants and trees in a climbing pattern. How do I get rid of them? So I wonder, do you think it could be that cucumber, wild cucumber? Could be. Because that, if you get rid of that right away, but you have to be on it, at least mowing near your woodland, getting, taking care of that from germination. If yes. that's what it is, that's easy. That's easy. If it's, she wants to look at it and uh, work her way down to the stem. You can prune it ground level, but be prepared. You're going to have to control those re-sprouts. So if you're not going to do that chemically, you're going to have to have a thick mulch on there or something like that to keep it from regenerating. Prune at the bottom and then tr control the re-sprouts. Mm -hmm. Good mow tips. Can mow it. You could continue, yep. but mowing, yep. you're going to yep. have to continue yep. mowing. Yep. Yes. Great. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Bob. Now, Deb, as spring is fast approaching, Burns Greenhouse has been making their own preparations. Yes, we've been getting ready, getting our soil ready. And I just thought I would share it with people what we do. Like, here's our soil. Um, we do our own soil, and we pasteurize our soil, and we um, add perlite to it, and we bake it to 170 degrees, and we do about two uh, cubic yards a day. And then we fill all of our trays with it. This is where we're plugging and seeding, and my dad can do, that's, a, I think, a 512 tray, so 512 cells and about 30 seconds to do it. And then we put it in a germination cham chamber and we can regulate the heat pretty well, even with LED lights um, and some nice plastic covers. And then um, after we do the, the um, soil, then we move on to um, some of the cuttings and um, setting cuttings into the um, soil. So I think our next one, um, is those are the cuttings that we get in. And the, the varieties of cuttings and everything that's available is amazing. And we get them in from all over the world, and then we hydrate them, and then we stick them. And then these are our trays, and we just prep our trays, and then we stick, and we stick, and that's our growing room. And it takes about three weeks at um, about 65, 68 degrees under bench heat and a mist every 30 minutes and then you have rooted cuttings. And then this is when we bring in rooted cuttings, um, they're already rooted on certain patented plants. And then this is about 20,000 that we get on this shipment. And then the whole family chips in, um, the farm supports the family and the family supports the farm. And here we unload them and we will be planting them and sticking them and getting all the soil prepared for them um, out in the greenhouse. And it was a great weather this spring. And then we have the new varieties that came in. Uh, nice new, um, well, that's a new canna, that's galardias, new galardias, uh, new um, lottie dotties, um, new, um, all kinds of new stuff. Um, and, oh, that's the hummingbird salvia and new petunias, always new, lots of new colors there. And tropics, they're pushing tropics, calicocias, beautiful all acacias and then proven winners has a couple new ones new beautiful um hibiscus it's just gonna i think they're pushing tropics and i mm -hmm. understand why because it's mm -hmm. been a really really nice spring mm -hmm. maybe we just got lucky thanks deb you make it look so easy it's a family lots affair. of practice lots yeah. of practice let's get back to some more questions um a caller from ely has swanson variety of grapes lots of leaves uh, but not as many grapes as he used to. Has six that are 10 years old and four are eight years old. Um, what is a good blueberry bush? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I we think can I'm, mix fruits. Yeah. No, right. <laughs> only in your fruit salad. Yeah. Not when you're growing them. I'm sorry, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm misunderstanding the question. We'll move on to the next one. Okay. Uh, what's a good blueberry bush for Hermantown area? Oh. And what kind of care is needed and how long until you get berries? Oh. From, a caller oh. from Hermantown. We love the Minnesota. The people kid me. These are the Minnesota half eyes that you want to <laughs> stay with. I love that. Yeah. yeah Cross yeah. between the Michigan blueberries and our native. And mm -hmm. I don't know, Deb, if you have some favorites, you spell it. Well, North Country and North Blue. North Country, North Blue, and the one that's really yielding is Superior as mm -hmm. well. And then uh, North Sky has come back. North mm -hmm. Sky is a shorter one. It was used for landscape purposes, really but nice. also is a, is a nice but a less productive. So. Uh, North Blue, nice, North Sky, North Country. Really. Yeah, North yeah. Sky is. Mm -hmm. It almost left the scene because of low productivity, but then the landscapers picked it up as landscape material. Beautiful fall color. Blooms beautiful. We have a berry and then a really nice fall color. Lots of good choices. I would say Hermantown, you got some heavier soils. Uh, let's get plenty of acid sphagnum, peace moss in there. Make sure you got good drainage and full sun. Low pH, 
full sun and good drainage and you can grow these varieties are good and winter hardy and will last for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Great. Margaret in Cloquet has more berry questions. We planted some raspberry bushes last year and they did very well. When and how do we prune them? Bob, <laughs> you've got some new research on yeah, this. We used yeah, to, we used to tell everybody, uh, you let them grow and you know you've got primal canes, floor canes and they grow over a two year period. These are our June bearing rather than fall bearing varieties. But we would always say let them go through the winter and then prune them back in the spring. Uh, Norse Farms did some uh, work out in their premier raspberry growers and small fruit growers out in Massachusetts. They did some work, which I think is valid, and they say prune in the, fu prune in the fall. So these are going to be the canes that were vegetative this year, the ones that fruited, we take Fruit. right off at ground level. The vegetative canes, we're going to cut back in the fall just a bit, and uh, that's going to set them up for next year. And they have good breaking that way, and they have more inner nodes that will break and flower more. And Isn't be more that what productive. Yeah. So that's why the yields were higher pruning in the fall than pruning in the spring. Different based on the research that was done by a legitimate uh, company Pro and mm -hmm. with help from one of the uh, ag schools there. Very good. Uh, Daryl emailed us and said he's done with onion sets. How densely should he show seeds this month for transplanting come spring? Okay, so boy, that, that can be tough. I mean, they talk like it's really easy to seed onions, but it isn't always. I, we do like to direct seed them, but we're going to go maybe another week, maybe two weeks, because yeah. we do think that the day length, again, makes a difference. It, I, it, I really am into this day length thing. <laughs> um, but, um, right, it depends on what he's growing them in and how tight, because you don't want them too tight when he's growing, but then you also want good germination. And so, and, and varieties are a little bit, you know, can make a difference, but we just go heavy because we don't always get the best germination. And we That's go- good advice. And, and then we, you transplant, right? And we transplant, and we go into like mm -hmm. a, it's an 809 cell, it's a PAX, and they're a little bit deeper, and so they get better roots on them before you're um, right. transplanting them and pulling them apart. And the onions grow very slowly, so you're right, First part of March, make sure you get them in. They're going to grow slow, but they're going to get a little longer. So you're going to seed them. You're going to transplant them into a cell pack or something else, and then you're going to have to give them a haircut yep. uh, with just the scissors because they will get too long and leggy mm -hmm. for you. And you just keep doing it. Give them it. plenty of time, yeah. transplant them out. We like to get in uh, May 1, if you can, with those, and we will be able to probably this year. Then you'll get some real nice onions it will set. The seed gives you plenty of choices, plenty of varieties, which you don't always get with the uh, what right. they call the sets. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Now, Bob, you wanted to share some information about upcoming gardening events. Sure, we're going to have some fun. We're doing our annual uh, spring gardening extravaganza. It's March 16th, so we're, we knew, of course, it was going to be an early season, so that's why we scheduled it early. No, the room and space was available then. But uh, March 16th, uh, we call it Color Your World. We're going to really look at colors and the, the implications for both flowers uh, so we're going to look at the science of color, we're going to look at the aesthetics. We've got Adam Swanson that did the beautiful color butterfly mural down on the rotunda there at the depot. He's going to be one of our speakers that's going to take this color. And then we've got uh, 13 workshops in the afternoon. Uh, register, there's a phone number for you there, but also just Google uh, St. Louis County Extension, look at uh, SLC or the Farm and Garden segment. If you want to get in, we can only handle a little over 200 and we are three quarters full now before we really have started to publicize it much. So the next one, next opportunity will be on the range, Mount Iron, uh, March 28th, expanding your garden knowledge. Uh, the people on the range requested heavy on the edibles. So we're going to do segments on garlic, segments on onions. We'll talk about varieties, growing them, planting them. Uh, segments on apples, blueberries, and then Deb's going to do a segment on cut flowers, which is big stuff this yeah, year as stuff well. For, big know, stuff. Everybody wants to be a cut flower grower. So she's going to help us out there. So we're going to have a lot of fun. Once again, uh, there's a phone number, 218-749-7120, or the St. Louis County Extension website. Get in and register early because there will be literally space limitations on both of these. Great, exciting events. Good events and yeah. lots of tremendous amount of early interest. And I think uh, people said when the pandemic went away that gardening would go away. That hasn't happened. Yeah. It's only getting bigger and stronger, and uh, which is fun for all of us that uh, are working in the industry and enjoy the hobby. Yeah. All right, let's get back to some more questions. Back to the question about the Swanson variety of grapes in Ely. Um, there are lots of leaves, but not as many grapes as he used to. 
He has six that are 10 years old and four that are eight years old. Do you have any suggestions on why there's less grapes? First, it's remarkable. Swanson Red. Swanson mm -hmm. was a farmer that that selected varieties on his own and worked with the university. That was one of the first university introductions. I'm assuming it's Swanson Red, and uh, not noted to be that winter hardy. So he's done a very Ely. good. Yeah, right. in Ely I in was particular. By that, yeah. So he's done a good job. He maybe has. good snow cover up there. Uh, pruning, of course, and uh, not enough fruiting. Uh, I. think think a little fertility he yeah, wants absolutely. there. He's mm -hmm. got the long days. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit of a genetic limitation mm -hmm. in view of the fact he's quite a ways. It's a wine grape and he's quite a ways mm -hmm. out of the, the main primary growing. Little fertility in the spring, pruning him back properly and that's about all I have. Right and you could add some new varieties or get some oh, new yeah. varieties and, and um, yeah because he's done really well. Yeah, really, yeah, really yeah. well. I mean, go with go with a beta, go with a valiant, go mm -hmm. with a bluebell. Those three big introductions yep. that we know are good and hardy, and people make wine out of uh, out of beta. They say it's not a wine grape, but there's been some wines actually that have won contests with this beta. And there we got hardiness and productivity. Valiant, bluebell, and beta would be mm -hmm. the big three. All have our cross with our native river grapes, so they're good and hardy. Yep. Awesome, Roy, who is north of Two Harbors loves growing bleeding hearts, love those bleeding hearts, but has had trouble growing them. Can you give some tips? So north of Two Harbors, mm -hmm. so. Away from the lake, maybe? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Soil composition or organic uh, material, I'm wondering about that, and no, light. Or yeah, we don't know shade or sun. Right, right. Bleeding heart, I hate to say it, aren't too difficult to grow. No, they're not, they're not. So they're I would. They propagate and they're easy to grow out, yeah. He's tried things and, and Deb maybe. Has he it, moved them? Right. Has he moved them? If they're not doing well where they are, move them. Let's move them. Yeah. I, I think he needs another location. Either there's poor fertility, a poor mm -hmm. mix, deep shade they don't like, but they'll take partial shade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say, and maybe it's a good word of advice, if it just isn't working for you, uh, let's find another location. Right. And there's uh, lots of varieties available that you could just pop in a few. I mean, they're readily available. Yeah. You, you, you could leave that are. and just put some new ones in, and there's some great even white varieties. Mm -hmm, and, uh, mm -hmm. and Valentine, and then there's yeah, the, the lime greens. Yeah, so there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty of variability there. Maybe a little fertility move in the very early spring. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nicole emailed us with two questions. Is a raised garden bed better for a vegetable garden, or can I plant them right into the ground? Number two, what is the soil ratio for raised garden bed for vegetables? Should I add compost? Yes, absolutely, you should add compost. We like, we like both an organic, which would be your, your compost and your uh, acids, phagna, meat box, your potting soil mix, and we like some mineral soil in there. So it's mm -hmm. going to be, and maybe that question was a ratio. And you could look, if you have a sandy loam mineral soil, you might look at at least 50% mineral soil and then uh, the rest organic or even a little higher mineral soil. I'm an uh, advocate of getting some mineral soil in there because that supplies all the trace, trace nutrients mm -hmm. that our peats do not have. Mm -hmm. uh, either can work out real well in the ground or up above. If you have real heavy clay or rocky soils, then a raised bed Makes will sense. definitely be better for you because you can do it a lighter soil with high in organic and mm -hmm. uh, so it'll work out well for you. But then sometimes there is more watering and more care that's going to go into a raised bed. Yeah, they're going to dry out faster. They're going to dry out a whole lot faster. So depending on how much time and you know how, how much space that you want to put in. I mean right. the ground is relatively easy. That's right. And it's you a know, little more you stable and, and you've, you... You could do kind of a hybrid of raising the ground level. Yeah. You, know, you can do you that as well, just, just raise beds and Ooh, that's a good raise, idea. raise them up. So we're going to look at two things with this changing climate. We're going to look at uh, good drainage and good water retention. That seems like they're opposite items, but uh, organic can be the key to that. That'll both hold moisture on a light soil and it will actually help drain off excess water on a wet soil. Because I would anticipate, like last year, very dry and mm -hmm. suddenly very wet and these rainfall events are characteristic of what we're going through. Right, they're supposed to be heavier. And mm -hmm. well, thank you. That's all for Great Gardening tonight. You can follow us on our social media channels on Instagram at Great Gardening PBS North and on YouTube at youtube.com slash greatgardening where you can find tonight's episode posted tomorrow. Thanks Bob and Deb for your great insights tonight and to our members, thank you so much for your continued support of PBS North. 
Your contributions help make locally created programs like Great Gardening possible. We'll return on April 4th with weekly episodes, but until then, let's take a preview of beautiful garden tours we'll see in episodes to come. I have lived here my whole life, my whole 81 years, and the house is 100 years old, and my grandfather bought it back in 1923. Between me, myself and my friend, we built the gazebos and the little house, and then she decorates them with... Stuff. Yeah, stuff. <laughs> Everything that's here on this property is done by us. It was all just a bunch of dirt and we added sod and gardens. Foxglove are one of my favorite flowers and so we have a lot of those and they kind of dance in the garden. It's challenging to grow um, some of the things that we would like to grow. Um, so we don't have a lot of colorful flowers in the front yard. We have a ton of hostas. We are fortunate to live on a double lot. And so that's allowed us to do some interesting things. All season long, there's a lot of bees. The sedum is always happy with the bees. The bees are, are on everything. And this time of year with the shrub rose, the rugosa, the bumblebees just dive in and swim in the pollen. It's just a delight to watch them. They're rolling around on top of each other inside a single flower. That little sign says, wildflowers welcome here. We just had that created for us because it's the line of demarcation between the regular plants and the wildflowers. With exceptions. With, ex <laughs> with a few exceptions, yes. <laughs>